Jesus Christ lived around 33 years, and the Gospels demonstrate that, at least in the book of Mark, for example, we have 15 chapters in the book of Mark, and five of them have to do with just the last week of Christ's life. So what we have here is an abundance of information in the last week of Jesus Christ's life. And there's so many things that we can do on a Resurrection Sunday to uh, point out uh, our focus on. Uh, of course, you can uh, focus on his, his trials before the cross. You can focus on the cross itself. You can call, uh, concentrate on uh, how he was buried and so forth. But we are going to concentrate this morning on one thing. And that's the empty tomb. Uh, Cindy, can you kill this light? I, I know it's going. I'm going to have PowerPoint. That's the wrong ones. It's the first one. First one, far right. You did. All right, do the next one. There you go. <laughs> All right, now we have. Can y'all still read your Bibles in this area here? Is it too dark to, to read your Bibles? Because, but you're not, I have all the scriptures up here. I'll tell you what, there's a portion where we're going to go to our Bibles, and in that portion, I'll ha turn the lights back on. But um, in the meantime, um, I have everything. Can you, can you um, make notes? If you're making notes, can you, is it enough light there? We can't open these blinds over here if you'd rather. Y'all can see your, Bi your Bible's okay and you can make notes. Okay, it's just that the PowerPoints come across a lot better when uh, the lights aren't uh, bearing down on it. Okay. So we start with, <coughs> excuse me, the empty tomb. Facts about the empty tomb. The tomb was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, hundreds and hundreds of years, of course, before Christ came along. Isaiah 53, 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So what this is referring to is that even though Jesus Christ was crucified between uh, two criminals, uh, he didn't go to a, a grave, a, like a potter's field or something like that, what he did, <clears throat> excuse me, was to have a rich man's tomb that was going to be prepared because Jesus Christ was going to have that burial is predicted here. And then in the rich man turned out to be Joseph of Arimathea. Matthew chapter 57, uh, excuse me, 27 verse 57 says, and when it was evening there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about this Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea is not too far from the city of Jerusalem and Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin but was the, a council, it was the chief uh, chief priests, the leaders of the religious of religion in in, in Jerusalem, and what did they think of Christ? They were not fans of Christ at all. They, in fact, they tried over and over to have him killed. <clears throat> so the fact that he was of the Sanhedrin, and he was the one that was going to donate his his tomb to them. It was probably a tomb for his entire family. 
and it was new. No one has used it yet. And he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. That means he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But not only did he offer his tomb, he went to Pilate to ask that he could uh, receive Jesus Christ's dead body off of the cross. And then he would go and buy some uh, very expensive linen to wrap him in. He and Nicodemus would take Jesus Christ and take him uh, to the tomb and lay him there. Just think for a moment how contrary that would be to probably 95% of the people or more in this Sanhedrin who hated Jesus Christ. Then think of the courage it took for him to go to Pilate as a, as a Jew and ask for the body of Jesus Christ, which of course uh, Pilate uh, was pretty much indifferent to, but it, it could have been very dangerous for him. Furthermore, it was against the Jewish law uh, for you to touch a dead person on the Sabbath, especially a high Sabbath, on which it was then. He disregarded all of that and did what was necessary to give our Lord a proper burial. So he was, he was quite a person in his own right. Uh, more facts. The tomb was hewn out of solid rock. A huge round stone was rolled in place to cover the opening, which made it impenetrable. This is Matthew chapter 27, verse 60. So when you have a huge rock, and you hewn out a, a portion of it in order to lay a, a, the dead, and then you have this huge stone that is rolled over in front of the opening, uh, how are you going to get in? I mean, this is, is this, this rock that rolled, it was, it was cut circular, and it would roll, uh, and stop so you couldn't enter. It takes several men, uh, to move this rock. It was sealed with wax between the stone wall and the round stone covering the opening to tell if the tomb was opened or not. This is Matthew chapter 27 verse 66. It was the chief priests that went to Pilate and asked him to seal this to make sure that no one would be able to get into that tomb without, without it being known. Because they knew, the chief priests, that Jesus Christ had said repeatedly that when he dies that he would rise again. And they were afraid that the Jews would come and steal the body. So they su suggested not only that they uh, seal, seal it, but a contingent of Roman soldiers were placed at the tomb to guarantee that no one would steal Christ's body. This is Matthew chapter 27 and verse 65. So this contingent of Roman soldiers, if you know anything about how disciplined the Roman soldiers were, uh, were placed to guard the tomb. Now, if something ha if somehow someone got, got into there and stole the body, then these Roman soldiers would have been executed. Even if they go to sleep while on watch, they could be uh, put to the stake, burned. So it's not like these were uh, half-hearted soldiers. They were very diligent in their mission. <clears throat> The fact that the tomb was empty by Sunday morning was a fact that even Christ's enemies did not dispute. That's a very important fact. It wasn't just that it was the, the Jewish followers of Jesus Christ that said that the tomb was empty. It was undisputed. Even those of his enemies, those, the, the, the church leaders, the Sanhed members of the Sanhedrin, those who wanted to kill him, everyone could attest to the fact that the tomb was empty. So the question is, how did it happen? It's in a rock. You, you can't penetrate this rock. It's got the big boulder in front of it. It's been sealed, and you have a Roman contingent keeping guard over it the whole time. So here are three possible explanations. 
The first one is, did somebody steal Christ, steal Christ's body? Well, I don't know how they could. They would have to uh, move, remove the big stone, and even if the Roman soldiers were asleep, which they were not, it would wake them up, and of course they would dispatch these people. Uh, there's, there's no way, the whole thing was designed so that no one could steal the body. Because, and of course, Satan was behind this because he wanted to, to prove that Jesus Christ didn't really rise from the dead. Someone stole his body. The second is even more ridiculous. Was Jesus really still alive and rolled the stone out of the way from the inside to escape? That's laughable. <clears throat> Jesus Christ died on the cross by the time that one of the Roman soldiers pierced him up under his ribs here and uh, blood serum came, came rushing out. Uh, that is enough itself to prove that he had already died because the, the at death, the, the, the platelets separate and it looks somewhat like water. He was already dead, but a, a spear up through your chest cavity all the way up here to your heart, I believe, would pretty well assume that you're dead. And so even some people would say, well, he was just weak. <laughs> so he was weak. He was in this, uh, rolled up in this linen. And so how would you, one man, roll that stone away from the inside anyway? It's, it's crazy. And then the third one is, did Jesus rise from the dead? Uh, was he resurrected? And that is, of course, the truth. Even though many people hesitate or hate to acknowledge that, we live, we serve a living Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, an angel rolled the stone away, not to let Jesus out, but so people could see that he was resurrected. I would like to be a fly on the wall when that angel appeared. Says he rolled one angel, not not. Of course, it, it was easy for him to roll it out of the way himself. And then he said he sat on the on that big round rock. He sat there while these hardened, battle hardened, probably Roman soldiers acted like dead men. They fell on the ground and just shook. They they were just panicked while that happened. But that's, I wanted to put that point in because it was open, but it was an angel sent by God to open it, not to let Jesus Christ out, but to show people that he was gone. <clears throat> so the Roman soldiers panicked when they saw the angel, and since Jesus was no longer in the tomb, they went to the chief priest and told them what happened. This is in Matthew chapter 28, verse 2 through 4. Now, can you imagine... When the chief priests heard this, now Jesus Christ had been a thorn in their side constantly. They would send uh, people to go to Jesus Christ and either arrest him or else uh, try to dissuade him in some way. And when they came back, they were followers of Jesus. What do you do when your own people are being are, are converted? And every, every time they would try to actually kill him, he would get away. So they were exasperated, but they were so glad. Finally, he's dead. He's out of our hair now. And then these guys, these soldiers come to them and say, he's gone. And they explained to him. They told the truth. They said what happened. And these, you just think the chief priests, they, I don't know what they thought, but I know what they did. They paid a large sum of money to tell the lie. This is to the, to the soldiers, the guards, to tell the lie that his disciples came and stole him away while they were sleeping. Now this is, this is while they were sleeping is in Matthew 28 verse 12 through 13. Now how credible is this concoction that they came up with that, uh, well, the guards fell asleep and someone, probably his followers, came and stole him out of the tomb to, to lie and say that he was really resurrected. First of all, how would they know what happened if they were asleep? 
How could they testify to that? And if a, if they were asleep, like I said, they could be executed while on guard, guard duty. If they went to sleep, they could be executed. And then not only did they pay them a large sum of of money, actually it was silver. Uh, they said, now look, whenever your superiors are going to uh, not be a happy camper about what transpired, we'll cover it over for you. So that's what the uh, chief priests said. And Jesus told his disciples repeatedly that he would be crucified, but he would rise from the dead on the third day. But none of the disciples or the women who went to the tomb believed it, even when they were told that the lamb, excuse me, that the tomb was empty. This is Matthew 24, 1 through 11. This is kind of dis, dis, concern, disconcerting to us that Jesus told them time after time. He says, I am going to be crucified and I will be in the tomb three days and three nights and then I will rise. Don't you think it's curious after he's told them that many times and the, the Pilate and the Sanhedrin uh, did all these things to make sure that the, the followers of Christ didn't steal his body. Wouldn't you think that they would at least be a little curious? Would you be a little bit curious? Think of their condition though. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He demonstrated Tremendous miracles. He did nothing but good. He demonstrated who he was. And they were so happy about this. And then, boom, he goes on trial, which are all, he had seven mock trials. We would call them, um, what's the term? Um, yeah, kangaroo courts. And then he's crucified on the cross. Can you imagine their hopes dashed? Everything that he had done must have been a lie. And they were just, they didn't, they, they were just stayed at home. They didn't even want to think about it. But not even one of them, not, not even one disciple, nor the women that were going to the grave, to the, to the site that morning, had even a slight suspicion that he had been resurrected. But you have to give them a little slack here because no one had been resurrected. Ha, ha, how could they know what it means to be resurrected? He says, I'll rise from the dead when he is the first. And he still is the first. He is the only one that has been resurrected and is now in a resurrection body. The next group will be us. And when Jesus Christ returns at the rapture, then we will get our resurrection body. But even after they were told that the tomb was empty, they still didn't believe it. When the women saw that it was empty, they run back and they tell the disciples, and they said the tomb is empty. They and they think so. This, they thought, and so did the disciples think. Well, someone must have stolen the body. Well, how could someone st steal the body? We already went through that, and so they rushed to go there, and then. Uh, they see an angel and so forth. But the point is, is that it was very difficult for them to understand that someone could actually rise from the dead. Now, there have been some resuscitations, such as Lazarus. Uh, he was, he died and Jesus Christ uh, was told about it and he took his time to get back there because it's after uh, three days and after three days the body stinketh. Make sure that he was dead because there would be some who say, oh no, he was just in a coma. And he rose from the dead as in a, as being resuscitated, but he eventually died again. He was not in a resurrection body. And there were others that uh, did that as well. Then there is the fact that there were hundreds of people who were eyewitnesses of Jesus and his resurrection body after he was killed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. All this combined is just drives the non-believers crazy because there's no solution to the problem of what happened to Jesus other than that he did what he said he was going to do, and that is he rose from the dead. 
Jesus Christ defeated death when he rose from the dead, so there is no reason to fear it. You need to know this. I, what I'm going to show you here in this scripture, I repeat many times at funerals. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 through 57. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that victory, of course, is what? Victory over sin, over death. So, when a person dies physically, then what takes place is that for a believer, his soul and his spirit goes into the presence of the Lord. For unbelievers, their soul goes to a, a compartment in Hades, which we assume is somewhere in the earth, uh, in torments. His, his soul goes there. You see, they are in holding, they're holding them there at unbelievers until the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20 where Jesus Christ is going to judge them and then they'll be tossed into the lake of fire. More about that in a moment. All believers will receive a resurrection body that will be similar to Christ's. That's Revelation chapter 6 verse 5. All of us will have a resurrection body. All of us believers that is. It's wonderful that through God's grace we will receive a resurrection body. Do you agree? Come on. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now, the next question I'm going to ask, you've probably never been asked before. You may have never even thought of it before, but it's a very important question. But what limitations will be put on your new body and what constraints will you experience in heaven? That is a shock shockeroo to a lot of people. What am I talking about? Uh, when a person dies, they go to heaven. It's a wonderful place. What are you talking about? Limitations on our new resurrection body and what constraints will you experience in heaven? W what is this? Well... There are warnings throughout the New Testament about the possibilities of believers being disinherited and losing phenomenal eternal rewards, decorations, privileges, and opportunities. I don't know what the percentage is, but most people in churches today, even on a, what they would call an Easter Sunday, have no idea what this is about. They don't know anything about these warnings. And I'm talking about believers churchgoers don't know what I'm talking about. And that's a shame because the New Testament is full of warnings to believers that you can suffer loss. It has nothing whatsoever to do with whether you're going to inhabit heaven or not. It has everything to do with whether you will inherit heaven or not. To most people, that's, they don't, well, that's no big deal. I'm going to be in heaven. That's all that counts. Not so as far as the Bible is concerned. There, these warnings are dire. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews compares a person who is executed in the Old Testament on, on two witnesses and they will be stoned to death. A believer who doesn't know what I'm talking about here and who isn't Growing in grace and knowledge, he's living a disobedient life. It says that it would be better for those who were executed than what he is going to live through. And we're talking about believers. It has zero, nada, nothing to do with hell. It has everything to do with heaven being an unequal place, just like earth is an unequal place. We're all not going to be the same in our resurrection bodies. Some of us are going to have these, these rewards, decorations, privileges, and honors, and opportunities. These are available to only believers who are obedient. Those who honor Jesus Christ, study the Word, and are moving forward in their spiritual momentum. 
There are lists of sins in the scripture that seem to indicate that if one is engaged in certain sins, he is going to, uh, he is not going to get to heaven. At least that is what it appears to say, but a closer look indicates that these lists are warnings not to unbelievers, but to believers who are going to heaven. Now that should be a wake up call for everyone that these lists of sins are given for believers' sake, not unbelievers. Here's, here's one of them right here. Revelation chapter 21 verse 7 says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, does this refer to all believers? No. There is there's a condition here, isn't it? He who overcomes. That means overcomes the world, the flesh, and the devil, and fulfills his mission in being a good and faithful servant. That's what that's talking about. But now the next verse is the one that we have to look at. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons, sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now this is a pregnant verse in the sense that is very very important, and yet most people read this and without even a thought, they think, uh-huh, this, this verse 7 is talking about believers and verse 8 is talking about unbelievers. And I'm here to show you that it is not. At first glance, it seems that verse 8, that if you are guilty of one or more of these things, you are going to end up in the lake of fire. Now, some of you may be looking at this and say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty brave. I wouldn't count myself as cowardly. And uh, I'm an, an unbelieving. Can a, can a believer be unbelieving? Of, of course. Have you always believed everything in Scripture and carried it out? Is there any a time that you uh, didn't trust God, that you were unbelieving and you took took the solution into your own hands? Abominable murderers. I hope there's no murderers here, but if you are, it's, you know, we'll make it. Immoral person. Have you ever done an immoral thing? Sorcerers, probably not. Idolaters, we have not... Uh, statues, but we make idols out of things. But this last one just kneecaps us right here, doesn't it? All liars. Is it? I'm not, I think it's safe to ask this question. Does anyone here contend that he's never lied? And if you say no, well, that was your first lie. <laughs> This is, this is not specifically just to these sins. This is just a realm of sins. If you, if a believer is, goes through his life and he's doing these things, it says their part will be in the lake of fire, uh, with a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But neither verse, verse seven, is talking about salvation. That's where people get all mixed up. Verse 7 is talking about those who are going to be rewarded. These are believers. So neither verse is talking about salvation, but inheritance. Both verses are looking are talking about inheritance. See, verse 8 follows verse 7, if you didn't notice. And what is the context? What is verse 7 talking about? He who overcomes shall what? Inherit all things, and I will be his God, and, and um, he will be my son. We must remember that the context in verse 8 is directed to believers who don't overcome, therefore shall not receive an inheritance. Now I look at you and you're straining. I know I haven't convinced you yet, but I'm about to. See that word there, part? That changes everything, that word part. I'll show you, we'll get to it on the next one. Inheritance is a family issue. 
Salvation is about getting into the family. Inheritance is about what you receive within the family or you hope to receive. Now here's the word part. The word part in, Greek, in the Greek is meros, M-E-R-O-S. It's a noun, nominative singular neuter, and it means a share or part of something. This was a technical word used in legal documents at the time to indicate the share or portion that was designated to an heir in terms of his inheritance. It is not talking about the person, it is talking about his share of inheritance. The believer goes to heaven, but his inheritance will not be going uh, to him, it will be going to the lake of fire. Let's look at it again. Again, we're looking at verse 8, right here. <clears throat> you have the whole list of sins. And it sa then it says, their part, meaning their part of inheritance, will be in the lake of fire that burns, uh, in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We'll get to that in a moment. But this is what I'm saying, is that when a person does not execute God's plan. They waste their time on earth. They're a mediocre, um, do-nothing believer. Then th their part of inheritance is going to be tossed into the lake of fire. That's what I'm saying. But think about this for a moment. Every person, every believer has an inheritance. It's not like that when you die, Jesus, I mean, uh, uh, God is going to hustle up and try to get some inheritance for you. Your inheritance was created in eternity past, specifically designated for you. Wonderful blessings beyond imagine, imaginable. It's, they're not imaginable. So these are the things that is for every believer. But if you squander the time in life and you don't grow in grace and knowledge and you don't obey the commands like to assemble yourselves together in order to study the word of all these if you don't do that then you're not going to receive those that inheritance so where does that inheritance go it tells us right here but their part their inheritance will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death I think I'll read this one more time even though we're Running short here. This word meros, a technical word used in legal documents at the time to indicate the share or portion that was de designated to an heir in terms of his inheritance. It is not talking about the person, it's talking about the, his share of inheritance. The believer goes to heaven, but his inheritance will not be going to him, it will be going to the lake of fire. And then we look at this, there's two parts to this. We have their part, which we just looked at, will be in the lake of fire, burns of brown, uh, brimstone, which is the second death. And I, ha I have that second death underlined because we're going there next. Let's look at that. The term second death is used only three other times in the New Testament. And it never relates to believers, but to unbelievers, death, Hades, and lost inheritances. That's what the second death relates to. Here's the first one. Revelation chapter 2.11. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. This is not only a believer. This is an overcomer believer. This is a believer who's going to be rewarded and decorated and has special privileges and opportunities. He certainly shall not be hurt by the second death. Why? Because the second death is for what? Unbelievers, death, Hades, and lost inheritances. He's not any of those, so the second death doesn't touch him. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and it says this is the second death, the lake of fire. So the second death is a synonym for the lake of fire. And so death and Hades is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So the second death relates to 
Hades, and death. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Well, I'll tell you what. Turn on the light, Cindy. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, because there's a few few verses that we there's, it was too long to just put on the PowerPoint. But there's a few verses that we're going to go to to set up this verse 6 because it's so important. Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to go to the PowerPoint on verse 6, but first of all, let's set it up starting with verse 4. Now, the tribulation has already taken place. The second coming has occurred. Satan has been locked up. And that's where now in verse 4 we continue here. And I saw the thrones and they that sat upon them. I want you to underline they there. This is John. He's talking about what he saw. I contend that the they is referring to church age believers. Us. Those who are rewarded. Those who are going to receive the decorations, crowns, privileges, opportunities, and so forth. And, and John saw them because he was seeing in the future. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and Judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had worshipped, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That is referring to Believers during the tribulational period that were martyred, they were beheaded for Christ's sake. And it says they came to life. Uh, they, they're going to receive a resurrection body as well. And they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. After the tribulation, the second advent occurs, and then during that thousand year reign, they are reigning with Christ, just like as the ones that it says in verse uh, at the first sentence, and I saw thrones and those that sat upon them. Then verse 5 is parenthetical, so put a parenthesis right at the first before the, and end it on the word completed. This is parenthetical. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. And the rest of the dead uh, would be unbelievers are going to be resurrected at the end of the millennium and that is when the great white throne is going to take place where they are judged and then the next sentence says this is the first resurrection since that was parenthetical this is the first resurrection actually is referring to those in what happened in verse 4 when they came to life and reigned for so what I did is underlined this is the first resurrection and take an arrow and point it up to the last part of verse 4. Do I need to say that again or y'all have it? You got it? Okay. Now, that was a precursor. So we're not talking about, none of that verbiage there is talking about, you can kill the lights now, Cindy. None of that is talking about just average believers. This is talking about believers who are rewarded. Those in the church age, they that sat upon the thrones, and those who were beheaded are going to be rewarded and so forth. So now we get to verse 6. I wanted to have that for uh, set this up. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. What does that word part, meros, what does it mean? Share or inheritance. So blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection over these, over those ones that he's talking about. The second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Is this talking about all believers? No, it's talking about only those who overcome. Now, the second death does not affect them. 
But the second death is going to affect believers who are not overcomers. Does it mean they're not going to heaven? Of course not. They're going to heaven. They're saved. They can't. They have eternal life. You can't lose eternal life. But they are harmed by the second death. In what way? Because their inheritance is going to be tossed into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, is not talking about everyone in the first resurrection, but only about the ones who receive an inheritance. These are the believers who will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. For those who don't receive a reward, they will be harmed by the second death in the sense that they will lose their reward in the lake of fire. More lists of sins that believers commit which cause them to be disinherited. I just showed you one list. Here's another list. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 8 through 10. On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud and that your brethren. Now, to set up the context, is he's talking to believers. Paul is chewing out the Corinthians because they were taking each other to court. Believers were taking each other to court in pagan courts. And so when he says, on the contrary, what you're doing is not right, you, you yourselves, you believers are wrong. And that word in the Greek is adikeo, A-D-I-K-E-O. Uh, uh, diakonos or dikeo uh, it means righteous. The alpha negative, that A before it means not righteous. And that's why they say wrong here. So he says, on the contrary, you yourselves, you believers, yourselves are wrong and defraud your brother, brethren. Now verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous, now the unrighteous here is an adjective, it's the same root, it's uh, adikos, A-D-I-K-O-S. The first one is, uh, I think, it's a, it's a verb, yeah, it's a verb, that's why it's adikeo. Uh, this is an adjective which still means not righteous. The same word is used, now that's important. He's talking to believers who were wrong, and now he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous, talking about them, shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know how many people I've talked to and I say, what is this verse talking about? He's saying this is talking about these unbelievers committing these uh, sins and they're not going to heaven. That, that, that has nothing to do with the context. He is talking to believers. He's already condemned them in verse uh, 8. And now he's talking about if you do these things, then you're not fulfilling God's plan. You're squandered. You are disqualified from getting rewards and decorations and privilege and opportunities and so forth. And so what's going to happen to you is that you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They will be disinherited. This is talking to believers. The ones wrong in verse 8 and the ones unrighteous in verse 9 are not unbelievers. They are believers who are disobedient and indifferent to God and His Word. And what's going to happen to them? They will be disinherited. The phenomenal blessings, rewards and decorations and crowns and privileges, all these things that God created for that for believers in eternity past, and they blew it. They squandered their life and God is saying they're all that wonderful things are going to be going to the lake of fire. They shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven, but they will inhabit the kingdom of heaven. Notice, well, <laughs> I'm redundant here. Notice it does not say they would inhabit the kingdom of God. It says they would not inherit the kingdom of God. Then we have another list in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Same thing here. Oh, by the way, I want to show you one thing I, I, I didn't point out here. 
In verse 9, it starts out saying, Or do you not know the unrighteous? What? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It has all these sins. And then it says, Shall, it says, Nor shall they inherit the kingdom. At the first of the verse, at the end of the verse, it's talking about inheritance. And people say, Oh, well, it means they're going to hell. Unbelievers going to hell. Whew. Context. So important. I just want to point that out. So here's Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealous, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Well, if you are thinking, well, no, that doesn't apply, that doesn't apply, that doesn't apply. When it says outbursts of anger, you, you're done. At least, let me put it this way. I know I'm done. Drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I for, forewarned you. Who is he talking to? Believers. Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, the same thing. And people look at these things, and they see these sins, and every time, they say, oh, well, this is talking about unbelievers. <sighs> Nowhere in that whole area of Scripture is he talking about salvation. That's the biggest problem with so many is that they, they go to uh, Scriptures like this and they don't know that so many times words like salvation are saved. Soterius in the Greek, salvation, sozo for saved. More times than not, it's not talking about being saved in the sense of receiving the gift of eternal life. It's talking about being delivered in a physical sense. I thought you'd like that. <laughs> He's going to heaven. He's going to get rewards. <laughs> and then, John, this is the last one. Uh, John 13, 5 through 10. Now this is at the upper room and Jesus Christ is going to wash his disciples' feet. It has great significance and it has a, has a part to play, pardon the pun, on what we've been looking at. Verse 5. Then he, Jesus, poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord... Do you wash my feet? That's what Simon Peter asked the Lord. And Jesus answered and said to him, What do I do? Oh, excuse me. What I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, Never shall my, shall you wash my feet. You know, old Peter's always putting his foot right where his mouth is. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your wash you, you have no what part with me. And part there is meros. It's the same term. And it's saying essentially, if I don't wash you, you have no inheritance with me. Now, what is the washing talking about? The washing is talking about confession of sin. First John one nine. And when when we confess our sins, it's like we are cleansed. But when we are saved, we are bathed. Our whole body is, is washed. And so essentially what, what Christ is telling Peter here is that if you don't, we call it around here, rebound. And when we rebound, it means that we have acknowledged our sin to God and we're clean. It means that we wash like Jesus Christ was washing the feet. But we don't bathe every time that we sin, but there's no need because we have already been completely cleansed. That's what is saying. the rest of this is going to say here. Oh, first John 1 John 1.9, If I confess my sins, acknowledge my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness, not only the sins that you have committed that you're aware of, but the sins that you committed you're not aware of, you forgot or whatever, that's cleansed too. That's what he's talking about here is wash. He says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me, no inheritance with me. 
Then Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and head. So he sticks it in the mouth, his mouth again. He, he means well. He's saying, if that's the case, then Lord, don't only wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Watch that. And then Jesus says to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash. The bathe there is what took place when you believe the Lord Jesus Christ, believed in him, then you were bathed in the sense your whole body was cleansed. All sins that you had committed were forgiven. And so he says, but uh, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean. You're already clean, so I don't need to bathe you again, but you do need your feet washed, which would be the same as cleansing through what we call re rebound or confession. And then he says, but not all of you. And there was he's talking about there was one there that from this context here, from what this is saying, it looks like he's talking about Judas. Okay, well, that was kind of a whirlwind go. Um, you can turn the lights on now, Cindy. It's okay. So, hallelujah! <laughs> Jesus is risen. And it's good news. But what we need to do is think beyond just going to heaven. We need to think beyond just receiving a resurrection body, which is going to be absolutely fun. The body we have is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, it's a miracle that the way our body is designed and so forth. The only problem is it wears out. The new resurrection body will not wear out. It will not experience pain or worry or any of these things. It's going to be a perfect body. But we need to even think beyond that. And that is, what are we going to be able to do with our resurrection body? And what will we be able to do in heaven? Because the ones that use their time wisely, the ones that are good and faithful servants, the ones that are growing in grace and knowledge, they're taking in the word, they're applying the word. <clears throat> Those are the ones that are going to inherit heaven and they're going to have opportunities and privileges that most do not have. And that is because they inherit heaven. Where the believers who are essentially ignoring God and his word are going to be affected by the second death in the sense that their wonderful, custom-made rewards and privileges and all are going to be tossed into the lake of fire, which is the second death. These are the things we need to think about. Now this last portion of our service is for anyone who is either watching, live streaming, or who may be here and they're, say, they're thinking, wow, this is uh, maybe a little bit over my head. But what's not over your head is that eternity is, is uh, right around the corner. And what you need to decide, the biggest decision you'll ever make, is what do you think of Jesus Christ? Well, is he who he said he was? Did he actually rise from the dead? You see, Jesus Christ did go to the cross. He died. He paid for all of our sins. Then he was buried, and he what? Rose from the dead. And now he offers eternal life as a gift. It's the only way you can receive it. You can't work for it. He offers eternal life to anyone who will trust him and him alone in order to receive that eternal life. In other words, it's not your works. It's his work. And when you put your faith alone and Christ alone in his work and nothing in your works, in that moment you are born again. You become a royal family member of the most high, you have a possibility of inheriting heaven and have a great inheritance that is unimaginable that will last for all eternity. If you haven't made that decision, if you haven't decided that in your soul and you're convinced that Jesus Christ truly is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him, then I would suggest you do it. Now let's close. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of who you are and our Lord Jesus Christ who paid it all on the cross. We're so thankful 
that we have that hope, that confidence within us that He truly is the Lamb of God that was slain, but He's not coming back as a Lamb. He's coming back as the Lion of Judah. And He will set all these things right now that are so distorted and, and evil. We thank you for all these things. That couldn't happen apart from him having a resurrection body and is alive. We will be singing his praises and thank you, thanking you for all eternity that our Savior lives. We pray this in Jesus' most high and holy name. Amen.